So in question number 13, we are asked to prove that this expression is same as or so simple pies to get this, where A, B, C, and D are integers. So in simplifying algebraic expressions, first thing you would look for is can we factorize any of the given expressions or terms in? So I can see that I can simplify x squared plus 3x minus 10 by applying a factorizing using double brackets. So which mean if I just copy that expression here, we're looking for two numbers times to make minus 10 and add to make three. So the factors can simply be five and minus two. So it means the given x squared plus 3x minus 10 can be simplified to x plus 5 and x minus 2 because these are the factors we found. So therefore, I'll simply write the given question now in the form 6 plus x plus 5. I'll just write the denominator 1 as currently there's no denominator, which means it's 1 divided by double bracket and each bracket, one of them has x minus five, so x plus five. The second one is x minus two divided by x minus one. Six plus the stays outside the bracket. I'll keep the first fraction, which is x plus y over one the same. And I can change the divide into times, which means this second fraction can now be flipped. So therefore, x minus one will become the numerator and x plus five and x minus two is now a denominator. So therefore, the numerator x plus 5 and the denominator x plus 5 can be cancelled. So we are now left with 6 plus. So that's 1. 1 times x minus 1 is simply x minus 1 divided by 1 times x minus 2 is x minus 2. So if I can simply open the brackets, it would look like 6 over 1 plus x minus 1 over x minus 2. So to add the two fractions, I would have to make the denominator the same. And easier way is simply to multiply the first fraction in this case by x minus 2. So therefore, I would get 6 bracket x minus 2 over x minus 2 plus the second fraction stays the same. Because the denominators are the same, so I can simply add the top. So I can simply expand them as well at the same time, which would give us 6x minus 12 plus x minus 1, all divided by x minus 2. And therefore, we can add or take away the like terms. So 6x plus x give us 7x. And minus 12 minus 1 gives us minus 13 over x minus 2. And here we go. We have now got exactly the same form as the question required, which is ax minus b and AX, cx minus d. Let's now move on to question number 14. In question number 14, it says a car moves from rest. The graph gives information about the speed, which is drawn along my axis in meters per second, of a car t seconds, which is the time given along x axis. 
So from where, where it started and So in question number 14, it says a car moves from rest. The graph gives information about the speed, meters per second of the car t seconds after it starts to move. So the speed is given along y axis and the time is given along x axis. In the first part, they want us to find an estimate of the gradient of the graph at t equals 15. So to find the gradient, we know the formula is simply change in y divided by change in x. So first thing first, we'll have to go to the time at t equals to 15, which is basically that point. So if I mark it with a dot or a cross to be specific here, and then basically draw a straight line, which should basically touch that point or meets that point. So I'll try to be as accurate as I can. And again, the straight line drawn may vary. So if you try to be accurate as you can, then we probably get the best possible gradient. So let's say this is the line I've got. So we can therefore pick two points on this line so that we can form a triangle and try finding the change in y and change in x. So let me just figure out the two best points I can have on this graph. So I can half this point, which is basically 7.5. And I can have another point on a line as this, for example, which is 20, sorry, 17.5. So what I can simply do, I can draw two straight lines like this and that. So that would be change in Y. And that would be changed in x. So first, we'll figure out how much is it changing in y. So this point is 20. And this point along y-axis is 12.5. So the change in y is basically 7.5. This way. And change in x is going from 7.5 to 17.5, which is 10. So change in x is basically 10. So the estimated gradient, as we just discussed, so it will be 7.5 divided by 10, which gives us not. 0.75. So again, that gradient may vary. So if you if you draw it on a on a paper, you may be uh, drawing it more accurately, and the the, the line you have drawn uh, may give you uh, a fairly different answer than this. So again, they they always give you a, a given range of our, of of your answers. So 0.75. Uh, I would I would think 0.7 or 0.65 they probably be in the same range of the gradient. So in part two, it says, describe what your answer to part one represents. So what we just found is the change in speed divided by change in time, which is basically acceleration. So what we found in part A, is basically an acceleration. So that's the second part of question 14a. Let's see what it says in the next part. So 
In the next part, it says work out an estimate for the distance the car travels in the first 20 seconds of this journey. Use four strips of equal width. So I can simply use the same graph I've got here and use the calculation for that given question. So as it says, four strips of equal width, I can simply draw four lines like for first 20 seconds, first strip, second, third, and fourth. So now by drawing those four strips, I can see I've got four different shapes. So if I join the first shape like this, that makes a triangle. Second one makes trapezium. And so as the third and the fourth. So whenever you're asked to find the distance the car travels, basically, if you find the area under the curve, that will give us the distance the car that traveled. So area under the curve means I've got four shapes here. So if I number them, one, two, three, and four. The first shape is a triangle. And how do we find an area of a triangle? Half times base times height. So if I say this is the base, and this is the height. So the height is, if I calculate from the graph, is 3.5, or it's meeting 4. So I can say half times base times height, which is 10. Similarly, for the second one, second shape is the trapezium. So I'll just number them one, two. So trapezium area is sum of parallel lines times by the height divided by two. So parallel lines are basically four plus, um, it is approximately from what I can see on the graph here is, 12. So 4 plus 12 times by the height, which is 5 divided by 2. So that would give us 16 times 5, which is 4 plus 12, that is 16 times 5 divided by 2 which gives us 40. Similarly, we can find out the area of the third shape, which is again a trapezium. So that we worked out in my graph is 12. So you may have slightly different in your, uh, in your question, in your paper. Um, and that height is approximately I would say 70. So that would be there for 12 plus 17. Again, the, the height of the trapezium, which is that, is still five because we are having this equal width divided by two, which would give us 12 plus 17 times by five divided by two. So that comes out as 72.5. And the last ship is also a trapezium. So we got this as 17. That is exactly on 20. And the height is still five. So 17 plus 20 times by five 
divided by two. That would give us, if I put those in the calculator, that would give me 92.5. And therefore, if I add all of them, it will give us the total distance travel by the car in the first 20 seconds. So 10 plus 40 plus 72.5 and plus 92.5 gives us 215 meters. That's your answer for 14B. Let's move on to question number 15. In question number 15, you're making and the subject. So whenever you're trying to make a letter the subject and the letter is in denominator, so you've got two M's here, one in the denominator here and one is on the top. So we'll try to move that denominator M on in the numerator so that it's easy for us to make it the subject. So our first times both sides by M minus one, which will give us F bracket m minus 1 equals 3m plus 4. So if I expand this bracket, that will give us fm minus f equals 3m plus 4. And because we are making m the subject, so I'll try arranging all the m's on one side. So I'll take away 3m on both sides so that all m will be arranged on the same side. So that would look like fm minus 3m minus f equals 4. And I can also get rid of this minus f by adding f on both sides, which will give us fm minus 3m equals 4 plus f. And finally, we can simply factorize this because you're finding M. So we want M on its own. So by factorizing it, I'll get M outside the bracket. Inside the bracket, I've got F minus three is equal to four plus F. And which will allow us to find M on its own by dividing F minus three on both sides will simply give us four plus F over F minus three. Last we move on to question number 16. Okay, in question number 16, the straight line L has an equation that is three y equals four x plus seven. And there's a point A that has a coordinate three minus five. We're asked to find an equation of the straight line that is perpendicular to line L and also passes through point A. So when it says perpendicular, it means they are at 90 degrees. So the standard straight line equation is written in the form of y is equal to mx plus c. So we are looking for two things here, the gradient of the required line as well as the y-intercept, which is the value of c. So the properties of perpendicular line says that the gradients are negative reciprocal of each other. So what I would try to is because we are given the straight line L, so I'll try making y the subject in this equation so that when I find a gradient of line L, I can also find the gradient of the perpendicular line by using its properties. So let's write down the equation of line L, which is 3y equals 4x plus 7. So if I divide both sides by 3, I will get y is equal to 4 over 3x. 
plus 7 over 3. And now, if we compare this new equation to the standard form of the equation, the gradient of line L is found to be 4 over 3. And as I mentioned earlier, the gradient of the perpendicular line is negative a reciprocal of each other, which means the gradient of the perpendicular line will be opposite sign of what we've currently got. So, and it will be a reciprocal of that. So I just need to flip that gradient around. So we have now worked out the gradient of the perpendicular line. Now we're also looking for the y-intercept. To find the value of c, they've given us a coordinate a that also passes through the perpendicular line. So what I will simply do, I will simply use the standard y equals to mx plus c equation and substitute the coordinate x and y into that equation along with the gradient we just found to find the value of c. So if I use the coordinate 3 comma minus 5, so obviously this is x and this is y, and therefore the equation y equals to mx plus c would look like minus 5 is equal to minus 3 quarter of x, which is 3, and plus c. So if I try solve this equation for c, we will be in a position to find the value of c then. So minus 5 is equal to our times minus 3 by 3 to get minus 9 over 4 plus c. Add 9 over 4 on both sides to get rid of minus 9 over 4 from that side, which will give us minus 5 plus 9 over 4 is equal to c. And to add them, we'll make the denominator the same. Currently, it's 5 over 1. So if I times that fraction by 4, that would give us minus 20 over 4 plus 9 over 4. And this would basically give us the value of C. Denominators are now same, so I can simply add the top. So minus 20 plus 9 is equal to minus 11, and 4 will stay in the denominator. So we have also now worked out the value of C. So because these two are the main bits, we need to find the value of the gradient and the value of the y-intercept. Now we're in a position to simply write the equation of the standard uh, perpendicular line in this case. So y is equal to minus 3 quarters of x, which means y is equal to mx plus c. And c is found to be minus 11 over 4. And this is the required equation of the perpendicular line. Let's move on to the next question. Okay, so in question number six, 17, it says there are some small cubes and some large cubes in a bag. The cubes are red or the cubes are yellow. They've also given us the ratio of the small to large cubes, that is four to seven, and the ratio of the red cubes to yellow cubes is three to five. In part A, they want us to find why? Explain why the least possible number of cubes in a bag is 88. Okay. So to work this out, first of all, we need to know the total number of the ratios of the small to the large cubes, which add up to 11. And also the total number of red cubes to yellow cubes, they, the ratio add up to 8. So if you think 11 and 8, obviously, the lowest common multiple of them is 88. So I've got simply to say here that 
the lowest common multiple. Of 11 and 8 is 88. So that should be simply A. That's part A done. Let's have a look in the next part. It says all the small cubes are yellow and they want, want us to work out the least possible number of large yellow cubes in a bag. Okay, so let's try to work out, first of all, the a small number of yellow cubes in total. How many are there in the back? So to work this out, first of all, I would say, what is the ratio of the small cubes? So the ratio of a small cube, as we know, four out of 11. And how many yellow cubes are there in total? Uh, in, a, in a form of ratio again, which is five out of eight. So the yellow ratio is five over eight. So if I times them, that would give us 20 over 88. And we know that four eleven of the total of the cubes basically are small cubes, which gives us 32 because 88 divided by 11 is 4, sorry, 8, and 8 times 4 is 32. So it means there are 32 small cubes, which means 32 small cubes are yellow. Now, if we have a look, for the large cubes. So similarly, the ratio for the large cubes will be seven out of 11. And because we're looking for information about the yellow cubes in this case, so the yellow cubes again are five eight. So if I times them again, that would give us 35 over 88. So this information shows it, shows that so 20 out of 88 was the ratio of the small yellow cubes and 35 over 88 are the ratio of the large yellow cubes. So it means the total number of yellow cubes will be 20 plus 35, which gives us what 55. So therefore, if 55 are the total number of yellow cubes and 32 are the small yellow cubes, so we can simply find out the large yellow cubes by taking them away. So 55 take away 32 gives us 23. And that will be the large yellow cubes. And that's question number 17 done. Let's move on to question number 18. Right, so in question number 18, we're given with a circle with four points on it, A, B, C, and D. What is also given, BA is equal to BD, which is that, these two lines, and if we consider, if we see this triangle ABD, if these two are equal sides, it means it is an isosceles triangle, which means two of the sides in a triangle are equal. And also CB is equal to CD, which is the other triangle. CBD has got two equal sides, hence it is also an isosceles triangle. An angle ABD is also given, that is 40 degrees. The angle required is the size of angle ADE, which is this angle. 
So we must give reasons for each of our steps in order to gain full marks. So first thing, when the triangle is isosceles, the base angles are equal. So I can say that this angle will be equal to this angle. So we know that angles in a triangle add up to 180. So I'll write down sense angles in a triangle add up to 180. So if I simply take away first 40 degrees from 180, that would give us 40 degrees, sorry, 140 degrees. And this 140 degrees will be equal to these two angles. And because both of them angles are same, so I can divide 140 degrees by two to get each of those angles that is 70 degrees. So it means I can say that this angle is 70 degrees as well as the other one. Now if we go to the second triangle ABCD, we aim to find at least one of the angles. Currently we don't know any of the angles in that triangle. So to find one of the angles within triangle BCD, I'll apply a circle theorem, which says opposite angles in a cyclic or bilateral add up to 180 degrees. So when we set a positive, so I can say angle A, which is this angle 70, plus angle C, which is this angle, or we can specify as BCD, they add up to 180 degrees. So we already know angle A, which is 70 degrees. So to find angle BCD, I'll simply take away 70 degrees from 180 degrees to get angle C or angle BCD. So that would simply give us angle 180 minus 70. So angle C or BCD will be equal to 110 degrees. So we have now managed to find this angle as 110 degrees. Now applying the same rule because it's an isosceles triangle. So I should be able to find uh, the other two angles, which is that and that. So again, angles in a triangle add up to 180 degrees, same rule apply. So first of all, I would take away Hundred and ten degrees from hundred and eighty degrees to get seventy degrees, and again, if we divide seventy by two, why by two? Because these two angles are equal to are equal to each other. Hence, uh, seventy will be split it up between them uh, equally. So that will give us thirty-five degrees. So this angle we have now worked out as 35 degrees. Finally, we can see that this is a straight line. So angles on a straight line add up to 180 degrees. So that's what I'm going to write. Angles on a straight line at up 
to 180 degrees. And this will basically allow us to find the angle ADE. So I can simply first for take away the two angles we found, one that is 70 degrees on that straight line as well as 35 degrees. So take away 70 as well as 35 degrees from 180 which would give us uh, 105. If we add these two, take away from 180 is 75 degrees. So therefore, angle A, D, E is equal to 75 degrees. And that's question number 18 done. Let's move on to question number 19. Okay, so question number 19 says, the diagram shows a triangular prism and the base ABCD is a square of side 15 centimeters. Also, the angle ABE or CBE, they are equal to 90 degrees. M is the point on line DA, such that DM ratio MA is equal to two to three. So let's put up a point M somewhere on line DA, just say zoom that somewhere here. Now required is the size of the angle between EM and the base of the prism and give the answer correct to one decimal place. So if I first join E to M and M, the base of the prism, let's say, obviously if I join M to B, that would show us the base of the prism. So let's call, or label this point M, and this is the angle we are basically looking for. So that triangle E and B, at the moment, we don't know any of the sides in that right angle triangle. The only thing obviously we know is, is what I just said, this triangle is also a right angle triangle. So to find angle E and B, we would need to know at least two of the sides so we can apply Sokatoa in order to find that angle. Okay, so let's see what we can find. So if I first consider the triangle, and let's draw that triangle on the side here. So this is E, A, and that's B. And that angle we know is 90 degrees. We also know AB is 15 centimeters. And this angle is 35 degrees. So which means I can find out side EB using trigonometry, using Sokatoa. So we're given with adjacent, so 15 centimeter is adjacent, and we are, we, we are trying to find AB here, which is opposite in this case. So I can use tan of angle X is equal to opposite over adjacent. So to find opposite, which is same as EB, I can times by adjacent on both sides. So that opposite will be equal to adjacent times 10x. So therefore I can say that 
EB is equal to adjacent, which is 15 times tan 35 degrees. So we can use our calculator now to put the values in to find EB. So 15 times 10, 35, give us 10.50311. I'll have more number of decimal places at the initial stage of our answers. Obviously, when we put a final answer, uh, we will have to put in uh, to, to one decimal place. So currently, I've now found EB that is equal to 10.50311 centimeters. So let's put 10.50311 there. Now we are still not able to find the angle because we need at least two of the sides in triangle E and B. We've so far found one side and that side 10.503 wouldn't help us finding the other two sides. So we'll then use our second condition, which is the ratio of DM to MA, that is two to three. Okay. So if we try considering the top view of the triangular prism, which is a square base. So let's draw it here. So let's suppose this is a square of 15 centimeters each side. And let's assume M is somewhere here. So if I join from B to M, it would look like this. So if I just label this M, this is A and this is B. At this point, we know A to D, the total length is 15 centimeters, but the length from M to A, which is that length, is not known. Therefore, I can simply use the given ratios to find MA. So to find MA, MA is three-fifth, according to the given ratio, three-fifth of the total of AD. So if I just put three-fifth of 15, which will then help us finding AM. So first I would divide 15 by five, which is three, and three times three is nine. So it means A to M is nine centimeters. So therefore, we can now find MB, which is basically this length in that 3D triangular prism shape. So I can simply use Pythagoras theorem to find MB. So because it's the longest side, that's an hypotenuse. So the formula will be MB is equal to square root of A squared plus B squared. So let's put A squared as 15 squared and B squared as nine squared. So if we just use our calculator again to find the square root of 15 squared plus nine squared, which will give us 
So if I just label that here too, 17.493. Okay, so we're just a few steps away of finding that angle now because we have now found two sites, EB and MB in triangle EMB. And therefore we can use these two sides to find an angle. Again, using trigonometry, so Kartoa. So I know the adjacent and I now find, I know the opposite as well. So again, by applying the formula tan of angle X, so let's say this angle is X for now, is equal to opposite, which is 10.50311 divided by adjacent, which is 17.493. And to find angle X, I would do 10 inverse of 10.5 0311 divided by 17.493. And if I just use simply my calculator to find the angle X, so 10 inverse of 10.50311 divided by 17.493. And that gives us 30.981 degrees. Don't forget, we need our answer to one decimal place. So to one decimal place, it will be 31.0 degrees. And that's the value of the angle between EM and the base of the prism. Let's move on to the next question. Okay, in question number 20, we are given with a quadrilateral CDEF um, and some of the vectors are given. So just try to label them out as well at the same time. So CD is Vector CD is A, DB is B, and vector FC is A minus B. So these are the three vectors given. In part A, it says express FB, which is the vector, this vector. We need to express this in terms of A and or B. Give your answer in its simplest form. So to find our vector F B, you can simply go that route from F to C, then C to D, and then D to E. So I can simply write down in the form of vector F B is equal to FC, which is A minus B, then CD, which is A, and then plus DE, which is B. So I can simplify that. So B minus B will cancel out. So vector FE is equal to 2A. So that's part A done. In part B, it says M is the midpoint of DE. So that's the midpoint. So can I say that D to M is basically half B? And similarly, M to E is also half of B because DE as a whole is equal to B. So if M is a midpoint, then DM as well as ME will be half B. 
It also says that X is the point on FM. So X is the point such that it's ratio FX to XM equals N ratio one. And also says C X E is a straight line. In part B, we need to work out the value of N. Okay, so to find out the value of N, which is basically the ratio of FX um, or N lots of FM. So let's see what we can try finding out here. So we're given that CXE is a straight line. So can we see what we can find out here? Let's see if we can find out CE first. Um, so CE will be equal to CD plus DM. So CD is A and DM is B. So CE is now easily found as vector A plus B. Now we can think about finding either CX or XD because CE is split up uh, as a part of CX or and XE. So let's try finding CX. So to find CX, I can simply go that route. So because we are going opposite to FC, we're going in the direction of CF. So the A minus V B will be changed its, uh, into its opposite signs. So it will become minus A plus B. And then we're going from F to X, which is the N lots of FM. So we still haven't found what FM is. So if I just write down N lots of FM here and just call it a star equation for now. So let's try working out FM first. So if I draw an, a line FM, which is that blue line, so to find FM, we can go from F to C, then C to D, and then D to M. So F to C is A minus B. C to D is simply A, so positive A because we're moving in the same direction, and D to M is half of B. So simplifying that will give us A plus A, which is 2A, and minus B plus half B, is minus half B. So we have now worked out FM, which means we can replace this value or substitute this value back into the star equation we put. So therefore, the CX equation will become minus A plus B plus N lots of FM, which is 2A minus of B. So I can simply extend, expand the bracket by multiplying that by N. So CX will therefore be equal to minus A plus B 2AN when we expand it and minus half BN. So if we try arrange all A's and B's together, so it will look like minus A plus 2AN plus B minus half BN. So if I work out on the top from here, 
Um, so CX. If I factorize A's and B's, so I'll get A outside the bracket and I'll get minus one plus two N. And similarly, we can factorize the second part in form of B. So the common factor is B. And I'll be left inside the bracket, one minus half N. Since we know that CXC is a straight line, so CX must be having a common factor of A plus B, which means minus one plus two N and one minus half N must be equal to each other. So I'll just try equating this. And basically we'll then try to find the value of N, which is what we need. So if I add one on both sides first, to get rid of this one, so two N is equal to two minus half N, then add half N on both sides, to have all Ns on one side basically, so it will look like 2n plus half n is equal to 2. And 2 plus half is basically, you can make the denominators the same to add the fractions. So if I times that fraction by 2, that will make 4 over 2n plus half n equals 2. That would make 5n over 2. So if we times both sides by two, to get rid of that two from the denominator, that would give us five n equals to four, and divide both sides by five to give n equals four over five. And this is what we were required to find the value of n, which comes out as four over five. Hope that you find it very useful. If you do, please like, share, and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one soon. Thank you.